This is Dr. Steve Cheney, and today's topic is the truth about sugar and the truth about artificial sweeteners as well. You know, there are a lot of myths and misconceptions out there about sugars, so my advice to you is maybe to question what you've been told. Or put another way, you might want to rethink what you've come to believe. So let's talk about the concept of urban myths. And I introduced that concept with nutrition when I talked about the truth about soy. Because there are a lot of urban myths out there. And how do I define an urban myth? Well, it often starts with a blog or a website. Sometimes these are doctors, but more often they're not. Uh, they're, but they're not trained scientists. So they don't know how to interpret the scientific literature. Their message is based on their bias. And they like to choose spectacular messages. And, and, you know, the other thing that I say about these blogs is they never let the facts get in the way of a good story. And then there's the media. The media, the newspaper reporters and, and the like, are, they aren't trained in how to interpret scientific studies either. And once again, it's a spectacular. It's the bad news that sells subscriptions. So as a result, the story gets repeated often enough that it becomes generally accepted as true. And then it becomes an urban myth. It may or may not be true, but now it's a myth and everybody kind of believes that this is the way it has to be. So let me put sugar into perspective. And you know, they say with years comes wisdom, but also with years comes perspective. And let me give you, let me give you an example of that. So back in the 70s, um, sucrose, table sugar, and dextrose, glucose, were the sugar villains. Uh, there was this book published called Sugar Blues. It was a blockbuster bestseller, and it really influenced the thinking at the time. And this book, um, the author, you know, summed up all the scientific literature and claimed that sucrose and dextrose caused obesity. They caused diabetes. They caused high levels of triglycerides in the bloodstream, and they caused an increased risk of heart attack and stroke. So, you know, people really became afraid of the amount of sucrose and dextrose in foods. The food industry tried to respond, and the first thing they tried was the sugar alcohols, things like xylitol, mannitol, sorbitol, galactitol. And, you know, as soon as those started to proliferate, the story started to appear that maybe those wouldn't be very good for us either. But, you know, something sort of maybe fortunate happened along the way. It turns out you can't use a lot of those in foods or people start getting diarrhea. And, you know, people get diarrhea from the foods that you make. You're not going to sell a whole lot of that food. So they never became tremendously popular. And instead, the food manufacturers turned to fructose and high fructose corn syrup, which, as you know, are today's villains. And guess what? They're t we're told that they cause obesity, diabetes, high levels of triglycerides, and heart attack and stroke. You know, that sounds awfully familiar. And it kind of raises the question, are there good sugars and bad sugars? Are there villains and heroes? Or maybe is it just the sugars are all bad for us if we consume a lot of them? And that's one of the points I really want to make, is there are no good sugars. This is a graph where looking at the number of different kinds of sugars that, are, you know, that you are familiar with in your diet or you've seen advertised. The orange bars, that shows the fructose content of those sugars. The green portion shows the glucose content of those sugars. And if you look at high fructose corn syrup, it ranges from 42 to 55 percent fructose. Now, right in the middle there are honey sucrose and grape juice concentrate. And by the way, if you go to the health food store um, and you're buying these naturally sweetened uh, pastries and so forth that aren't made with sucrose, they aren't made with fructose, it's usually the grape juice concentrate, the apple juice concentrate, the pear juice concentrate that it's made from. And you can see they're all pretty much the same. Matter of fact, you get to agave nectar, which some people just think is the best sugar out there, and that's 75% fructose. So, you know, what, where is the truth here? What is it that's going to make these healthy sugars as opposed to the high fructose corn syrup and some of the other things that we've already heard of as villains? Because, you know, if we consumed as much honey or agave nectar as we do fructose and high fructose corn syrup, they'd be just as bad for us because they have the same kind of fructose content. Um, you know, the, the, the thing is, honey is expensive. 
It also adds a taste to pastries and so forth. You can't use it in as high, large quantities as you can table sugar or high fructose corn syrup. Um, and the same with agave nectar. It'd be very, very expensive to try and consume it in, as, in the quantities, to, to put it in as many foods as uh, the manufacturers do currently with the high fructose corn syrup. So it's not that these are magical, healthy sugars. It's just because they're expensive, we don't eat a lot of them. So that raises a question. Is it the amount of sugar or is it the food that that sugar is in? And the answer is both. We're clearly eating too much sugar. The average adult eats 90 to 100 pounds of added sugar. This is not just sugar in fruits. This is added sugar every year. If we look at children and teens, 16% of the calories in the food that they eat comes from added sugars. And we keep eating more. Here's a graph showing sugar consumption from 1822 to 2005, and it's pretty much straight up. So that brings it with that, but then we need to talk about the kinds of foods. And that's something that's called the glycemic index concept. But basically, what we consume along with the sugar is actually more important than the sugar itself. And especially foods that are high in protein and soluble fiber, maybe, maybe have a tad of fat in them as well. Uh, this is going to slow the absorption of that sugar, causes a much smaller spike in our blood sugar levels, and then it has what we call a lower glycemic index. And basically it means it's better for us. Um, and that leads to some kind of surprising results. This is a graph I saw years ago. It's kind of fun to reproduce it because it makes the point. If you look at the same amount of sugar in carrots and ice cream, ice cream actually has a lower glycemic index. When you think about that, there's a lot of protein in the milk that the ice cream's made from. And if you've ever made ice cream yourself, you know it gets very crystalline when it sits around in the freezer. So what the food manufacturers do is they put a lot of guar gum, which is soluble fiber, in the ice cream to keep it from getting crystalline. So it's rich in protein, it's rich in soluble fiber, actually has a lower glycemic index per unit of carbohydrate, per unit of sugar, than does carrots. Now don't get me wrong, I'm not telling you ice cream is a health food. And actually ice cream contains a lot more sugar than carrots, so you know, there's kind of a trade-off there. But the point is we need to look at the food, we need to look at the protein, soluble fiber, it's not just the sugar that's important. So when you do consume sugar, it's best to consume it as part of a food or a meal that comes you know, with plenty of protein and fiber, particularly soluble fiber. And it's worse when you consume it as a beverage, cookie or a cake or pastry or something of that sort. Um, you know, the general principles of glycemic index, uh, you can make it as complicated as you want to, but very simply put, fresh vegetables generally have a very low glycemic index. There are a few exceptions, the starchy vegetables, potatoes, and that sort of thing. Um, but most of the vegetables have a low glycemic index. You can eat them anytime you want. You're not going to have, it's not going to have much of an effect on your blood sugar. Fresh fruits and whole grains usually have a moderate glycemic index. You want to use those more sparingly. And it's best if you consume those along with protein. And then there are the complex carbohydrates, things like the starchy vegetables, pasta, breads, even the high fiber breads, because that's usually an insoluble fiber source. They often have a high glycemic index. So those are things you want to use only with protein and soluble fiber sources. So we talked about the sodas being perhaps, the drinks perhaps being the worst uh, offenders. So it really is true. Uh, you know, the saying that I like to, to use, it kind of dates back to some films I saw maybe when I, was grow when I was growing up, probably Westerns, but just put down that soda and walk away and nobody gets hurt. Because the sodas really are bad news. The news about sodas is all bad. There are studies that show that sodas increase the risk of obesity and abdominal obesity, which is the worst kind of obesity, and also dramatically increase the risk of diabetes, heart disease, and stroke. And by that I mean the more sodas you drink per day, the more your risk of, those, those, of obesity and those diseases goes up. And, you know, it, it's not what the sodas are sweetened with. Sodas sweetened with sucrose are just as bad for you as sodas sweetened with high fructose corn syrup. And you know, it's not just sodas. There's some studies that show that fruit juices are just as bad as sodas. On the other hand, you can take that same amount of sugar in fruits 
and it's relatively harmless. And again, that's because of some of the fiber sources that are in the fruits that you've lost once you turn into fruit juices and of course never existed in the sodas. Um, but if you think about all those horror stories, whether it's about sucrose or fructose or whatever, all those horror stories you've been hearing about sugar, most of those come from studies where people are looking at soda consumption. They don't come from studies where people are looking at fruits or food consumption that contain sugars. But so the question would be, do you really, so, so we, if we think about the amount of sugars are bad for us, we're consuming too many of them, there really are no good sugars, so is the answer to use artificial sweeteners? Um, I, so I call this diet soda, uh, America's dirty little secret, or do zero calorie foods really work? Now the, the answer may seem like a no-brainer if you take foods that have calories versus foods that have no calories, you think, well, you're going to gain less weight with the foods that have no calories. But the answer might surprise you. If you think about it, between 1987 and 2000, the number of people using calorie-free sodas increased from 70 million to 160 million. So that's more than double. But in that same time period, the, the percentage of overweight individuals in this country increased from 52 to 66 percent percentage of obese from 20% to 32%, and the percentage of obese children increased from 10% to 17%. So we're consuming all these uh, calorie-free sodas, but we're not getting leaner, we're getting fatter. There was a study we had, uh, published uh, several years ago now in the journal Circulation, where they looked at 6,000 participants in the Framingham Heart Study. And they looked at those who were consuming sugar-containing soft drinks compared to people who were just consuming water. And those who consumed one or more sugar-containing soft drinks per day were 48% more likely to become obese and 25% more, more likely to develop high triglycerides or high blood sugar than people who were consuming water. But the interesting thing is they had a third arm of the study. They had another group where they were looking at people who consumed diet sodas. So artificially sweetened sodas, zero calorie sodas. And they assumed that those would be looked just like the people who consumed water. But they were very surprised when they found that people gained just as much weight with one or more diet sodas per day as with the regular sodas. Now this has been repeated several times in more recent studies. There have been some studies that have come to opposite results. And those are studies in which dietitians were very carefully regulating what people ate. So if you've got a dietitian, you know, kind of looking over your shoulder, making sure that you just keep your calories constant, and the only difference is whether you're eating a diet soda or a regular soda, sure, you're going to gain more weight with the regular soda. But, you know, most of us don't have uh, dietitians looking over our shoulders. When you look at free, free living people, uh, the diet the people consuming the diet drinks gain just as much uh, weight as the people who are consuming the regular sodas. You know, that's because we're, we're using those diet drinks to wash down our Big Macs when fries and Mrs. Fields supersized brownies and Starbucks chocolate chip muffins, large size, of course. Um, and, you know, the question is, why is that? There's some people who have, have claimed that maybe the artificial sweeteners short circuits our body's natural ability to judge calories on the basis of sweetness. There are other people that have claimed that these artificial sweeteners may cause insulin levels to increase, which increases our hunger. But I think the consensus nowadays is it's probably psychological. We feel, you know, we're cutting back on calories by eating the diet uh, Cokes or diet soft drinks. So we can eat, we can splurge, we can eat more of that other stuff. But the bottom line is that this isn't working. Um, the, these, the diet sodas, the uh, zero calorie foods, they're not working. They're not making us leaner. We keep getting fatter. Um, and then, you know, if they, if they were risk-free, that wouldn't be so much of a concern, but they all have risks. So if you look at saccharin, for example, sweet and low is the commercial name. That, is, that was shown to increase the risk of bladder cancer. And it was actually banned for a number of years, but industry finally lobbied and hard enough and probably some money crossed some hands somewhere and they got Congress to legislate the removal of the warning label so it's back in circulation. And then there's the, the blue packets. That's aspartame, which, may, which is called NutraSweet or Equal. That breaks down into chemicals that can be neurotoxic. 
And then there's a the yellow, the sucralose, labeled as splenda. I call it sucrose polyester. Um, it destroys some of the healthy bacteria in the intestine, uh, which you know decreases the health of our intestine. It appears to interfere with some medications, but it also can be metabolized to toxic organochlorides in the body. Um, so these are all things that you really don't want to be experiencing. Uh, a sulfane, so that's called sweet one or sunet. Uh, there are studies that suggest it has an, gives an increased risk of lung and breast cancer, and that it, this is one that there's pretty good evidence actually stimulates insulin re release, causes hypoglycemia, and therefore would make you hungrier and more likely to overeat. You know, if we think about the sort of zero calorie or very low calorie sweeteners, stevia is probably your best choice. It's natural, there's a long history of use. We know it's okay in small amounts. But would you have to, would you have to read the labels because it has a little bit of aftertaste. So it's often paired with artificial sweeteners in some of those blends. So then you get back into the same problems you had to begin with. The sugar alcohols, they do have calories, um, but they're natural. Uh, they're okay in small amounts, but as I said earlier, they can cause diarrhea and excess, and they can interfere with the absorption of certain essential nutrients. So, you know, when I think about these risks, they're not huge. And right now the FDA is telling you, so they're okay, you can eat them, they're safe. To me, it's all about avoiding the oops factor. And this is another instance of perspective. When you've been around for a long time, I can think of at least half a dozen times now in my lifetime where we've been told by the FDA that a particular artificial sweetener or food additive was safe, only to be told, only to be told later, whoops, we made a mistake. It's not as safe as we thought. We're gonna take it out of the food supply. And by the way, you shouldn't eat that. It might cause cancer or some other disease. So I like to avoid that oops factor. Um, you know, if these things really aren't doing any good in helping us to control our weight and they have potential risk, um, you know, why bother? So the bottom line is the risk isn't zero for these artificial sweeteners. How much you use matters. None are gonna be safe for everybody. And I'd be particularly concerned about children consuming large amounts of these sweeteners. And as I, said, as I said a minute ago, are they really the best choice? Do we really need them? Let's look at, for example, a sugar-free muffin. I mean, you can go to your uh, grocery store, you can find a sugar-free muffin, but chances are that sugar-free muffin is still gonna be high in fat. Uh, it's gonna be made with a lot of processed flour and so forth. It's gonna be low in nutrients, low in fiber. Contrast that to an apple. Yes, it has sugars, but they're all natural sugars. It's low in fat, and fat, it's packed with nutrients, it's high in fiber. Nobody ever got fat eating apples. So the truth about sugar, let me just bring it home, sum it up here. Um, sugar is sugar. There are no sugar villains, there are no sugar heroes. We do eat too much sugar. We Americans are consuming way too much sugar, but the food that we consume that sugar with is more important than the amount of sugar. As I said earlier, we want to be consuming that with foods or meals that provide protein, soluble fiber, maybe a tad of fat, healthy fats hopefully, and then we're going to have, you know, that sugar is going to be much less likely to cause spikes in our blood sugar levels and cause us problems. And the artificial sweeteners have risk. They have no proven benefits. We don't have, they don't actually help us to lose weight. So why use them? Thank you for joining me.